All right, we're going to look at Donna Haraway's uh, work on the cyborg, uh, and in particular her work, uh, a manifesto for cyborgs, science, technology, and socialist feminism in the 1980s. Uh, and the subtitle of this is a, an ironic dream of a common language for women in the integrated circuit. Um, and uh, it's taken from a collection of uh, poetry uh, and presented there as well. Um, this is Donna Haraway's most well-known uh, work and is often hailed as the uh, uh, fundamental text for cyber feminism, which you might not have heard of, but you're going to hear about now, which is, a, which is an extension of feminist uh, literary theory. And it moves into the area of uh, of transhumanism as well, and I'll I'll talk uh, in further detail about that in a subsequent lecture. Uh, but I want to talk about Haraway and the embrace of the cyborg as a as a a picture of what she regards as um, a helpful. Uh, image for uh, a new form of politics and a new form of, of thinking. And the main uh, thing that she wants to do with this is to break down the boundaries between uh, things that were in the past. So in terms of um, uh, the uh, structuralist understanding uh, of, of oppositions. So the, the opposition between uh, nature and, and culture and the opposition between uh, things like uh, male and female and the opposition between uh, a body and a machine uh, and the nature of the difference between uh, living and uh, non-living. And in, so in some ways we can see it as an extension of the sort of uh, dualism and as a representation of what uh, I spoke about as the significance of the zombie in uh, contemporary literature. Uh, it's it's neither alive nor dead, or rather it's both alive and dead. So it doesn't fit into the uh, the, the normal binary uh, definitions, which are so much a part of Western uh, logic since uh, back since Aristotle enunciated uh, the ideas of the laws of logic. So it doesn't the laws of logic don't apply to it. And so in the case of a once again of a um, of a zombie you can't kill it because it's not uh, alive um, and you can't resolve the problem of its identity on the other hand it's it's um, its threat is real and will take away your life so these are uh, are boundaries that are being broken but the three primary boundaries that Haraway mentions are that between the human and the animal uh, the organism and the machine and the physical and the non-physical and I would say that she it remains a uh, transhumanist and not a posthumanist. And to some degree, these categories start to blur insofar as she still holds on to the idea that there is something of a human uh, good there, even in the blurring of the boundaries or in the transgression of the boundaries, or rather in the embrace of the two oppositional structures as a part of the central uh, thing, namely the human. Uh, whereas in a, po a truly post-humanist uh, discourse, uh, there will, they will say that there is no essential difference between a human being and, um, and an animal, and there's no essential difference between a human being and a machine, and there's no essential difference between a human being and an inanimate object. Uh, there's, a, there's effectively nothing there. Uh, so it's more of a... Uh, more of a um, a utilitarian approach, and uh, and and for that reason, I don't regard it as philosophically speaking particularly um, uh, credible. Um, but I do want to say that they uh, fundamental to this whole question is the issue of of human anthropology, and uh, I've raised that already a few times uh, on the course um, when I was speaking about the definition of the imagination. Uh, in relation to Coleridge, we talked about the fact that it is uh, a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite and infinite I am. 
Um, but note that it's a reference to a mind there. Uh, the imagination is a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation and the infinite I am, but the infinite I am is a clear reference to God's revelation of himself in, uh, back in uh, Exodus 3, when Moses asked God who he is, he says, I am. And Jesus likewise um, in uh, the gospel says, before Moses was, I am. Clear reference to himself as God there. And the Jews understanding the reference pick up their stones to uh, slay him for blasphemy because they claim he isn't God. Uh, so that idea, though, that the imagination is a faculty that we use and at the same time is part of our identity is uh, the way in which Coleridge is starting to address the implicit anthropology of René Descartes. And if you recall back to uh, his understanding of human nature, or at least implicitly, in trying to solve the problem of, uh, of doubt, uh, was uh, and to establish certainty, he undertook the methodology of doubt. Um, he, so he was doubting all sorts of things because of the new sciences, the new discoveries of the nature of the cosmos, that uh, it was no longer the case as he had assumed that the, uh, the sun was revolving around the earth, it was rather the other way around. And so he wanted to establish certainty and he began with the point of his own knowledge that he existed. So he famously said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Later writers, and that includes Friedrich Nietzsche, would say that Descartes proved no such thing. He did not prove his existence. He merely proved the fact that he was thinking and that there was a process going on. So he never established a being out of this. He simply established uh, a becoming of himself. Now, this idea of a person's self as a process of becoming rather than one of being um, is characteristic of modern liberalism and also an anthropology that arises from it. And I've said to you on, on several occasions, one of the favored uh, metaphors for human nature uh, in the romantic period is the idea of oneself as an orphan. Uh, an orphan is somebody who has no uh, familial ties and indeed has no uh, social ties per se other than the one that he or she uh, experiences and there is also no immediate authority figure within the life of the orphan and these orphans which we can see th dotted throughout western culture post enlightenment um, represent not just the individual in the story, but the hero for us to emulate. And so we're to fashion our own identity through the process of Cartesian introspection. Um, and so there's a sort of a self um, tutelage going on there. Uh, you're, you're not being taught by example through the process of mimesis, through imitating your elders through what the Greeks would have called paideia, Rather, you are um, you are educating yourself in what the Germans will then uh, call Bildung. Um, and so at this time, there's also what uh, in literary circles we call a Bildungsroman, which is a, a, a novel about the education of, of an orphan in which the orphan effectively educates him or herself and models for the reader what is expected of the reader. And so there's a process of of becoming uh, the, the very thing that is uh, heroic for us to follow as well. So there's a model of self-creation in all of this that I think Descartes' cogito certainly was understood to be uh, revealing, and this is characteristic of uh, liberal modernism. And so there's an implicit anthropology in this, however, and the implicit anthropology has been described as um, a ghost in a machine. Because although the, the thinking substance, uh, the, 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 the mind, um, we're certain of that, the, the relation of that mind to the body is rather uncertain. Uh, it's, a, it's an extension of sorts. It's a race extensa, to use Descartes' phrase but it's unclear exactly what, how the mind relates to the body. So the, the, 
from this, the philosophers describe the mind-body problem that arises out of this. And uh, the idea of this as something which ought to be pursued uh, uh, fits in very much with the narrative of, uh, of a progressive view of history, the emancipation of human life from its early material and quite frankly irrational beginnings it fits again with with the darwinist account of the evolution of the species from uh, a, a basically a poetic uh, figure into a philosophical or a theological figure and then to a philosophical figure and finally into the scientific era uh, in, in which uh, the human mind develops and gradually gradually emancipates itself from its earthly material conditions and you can see how this fits in very much with a the gnosticism that i've already observed as characteristic of western culture as well and which our man uh, rv young in his at war with the word also identifies as being characteristic of the modern western academy um so there's an, an not just a history that accounts for the development of of liberal modernism but there's also an implicit uh, anthropology that's in there now the anthropology there as i've just said doesn't see the human being or the human person as having an essential nature it does not bear the imago dei uh, as as christians would call it there's no fixed image there uh, there's nothing that is uh, has a fundamental dignity uh, and is and is thereby subject to limitations. Uh, it's in, almost infinitely malleable. Uh, it's it's something that emerges from ourselves. It's something that we develop for ourselves. It's something that we choose for ourselves. And there is actually no uh, defined limit to the the power of ourselves to redefine ourselves. So in contemporary gender discourse, uh, people talk about self-identifying. And that language is, I think, quite characteristic and revealing because, it, again, going back to scripture, um, the only one who reveals himself is God. The only, the only feature uh, 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 of, of human nature is that God identifies us. He names uh, Adam. Uh, he says who he is and we're made in his image but note that adam doesn't self-identify himself he's named by god and and brought into relation to him through that and by the naming of course god is asserting mastery over him whereas when it comes to moses question to god in exodus in the wilderness and the burning bush and moses asked who are you he says i am who i am uh, in other words uh, he doesn't entirely answer the question he refers back to himself uh, for his identity but note that he is self-identifying there uh, we often in um, in english will call this uh, jehovah or or yahweh this is his own name but the name doesn't actually designate uh, the substance per se it's a self-referential thing because to name something is to give it to suggest it as an objective category and if it's an objective category then we can effectively be gods over it. So in the moment of revelation, God also hides something of his identity from us to prevent idolatry. And for that reason, to this very day, Orthodox Jews do not name God. Uh, even in writing, uh, they will, uh, let's say, a G and a D, and there'll be a dash in between, because if it doesn't have any vowels, uh, a word cannot be pronounced in English. So it's a, un, an unutterable uh, term. Uh, and if you do get any uh, painting from Jewish in uh, Jewish painters, uh, the, the depictions, uh, there are no depictions of God, first of all, and, and they tend to be rather, um, uh, I'm thinking of Mark Chagall here, um, they tend to be rather um, unrecognizable as, as human figures per se, at any rate. Um, but both, uh, but the idea here of the Cartesian self as an emerging phenomenon that we will uh, bring into full existence and as something entirely malleable views the individual self thereby as sovereign. 
And it's no longer God who is sovereign, it is the self who is sovereign and the self who will then unfold and determine uh, the extensions of the body. I talked about the mind-body pro problem. The chief uh, mode or <coughs> application of the idea of Cartesian selfhood post uh, the, the mid 19th century is the human body. And the human body will be determined uh, by the human self. And so, uh, and, and, and will only answer to itself. And we can see that in many ways, the, this idea of an anthropology that in which the body is determined by the mind or the self <coughs> is, is fundamental to the whole sexual liberation movement of the 1960s and onwards, where technology is used to liberate uh, women from the confines of, of social structures, but also in its later manifestations, and in particular here with the idea of the cyborg, <coughs> of the boundary between the, between the female body and the technology that's used to control it. So here in particular, I'm thinking about uh, the, the method of birth control, the contraceptive, which is a mean of gain, means of gaining power by an act of will over the body and regarding the extension of the body as something that one gains mastery over without any uh, accountability to anyone else. So there's an uh, intersection here between Cartesian selfhood and the uh, sexual liberation movement. Uh, and I want to speak briefly about technology here. I have a series of books uh, behind me that I think you can see, some of uh, which, um, I mean, I recommend them all. So there's uh, The Technological Society by Jacques Ellul, which deserves your attention. Likewise, uh, Technology and Justice by George Grant. Uh, I've, I think I've already mentioned uh, the Oliver O'Donovan's book, uh, Begotten But Not Made. Uh, and finally, uh, the work by Spayman, uh, Robert Spayman on, on uh, persons, and, the, and the, the subtitle is The Difference Between Someone and Something. But the uh, central text there would be probably Martin Heidegger's work, uh, Heidegger on uh, technology, uh, where uh, it, it, it's an essay called The Question Concerning Technology, and here's what Heidegger says. He says, everywhere we remain unfree and chained to technology, whether we passionately affirm it, as Donna Haraway will do here in the Cyborg Manifesto, or deny it. But we are delivered over to it in the worst possible way when we regard it as something neutral. For this conception of it, that is of technology as a neutral force, uh, which is commonly articulated in Christian circles, by the way. Uh, technology is something that we, we can use. It has, we determine what it does, but it doesn't have any purchase on us. It doesn't influence us. It doesn't determine us. He says that this is the worst possible attitude towards technology, as if it were a neutral thing. For this conception of it, says Heidegger, to which today we particularly like to do homage, makes us utterly blind to the essence of technology. And the essence of technology is domination and mastery. And we've already looked at, if you've done my uh, C.S. Lewis course uh, on uh, uh, the abolition of man, although I mentioned it also in my sci-fi sub-creation course as well, the idea of technology here is that we use uh, technology as gaining power over nature. Um, so going back to uh, Francis, Bacon's formulation, um, knowledge is power, and power initially was applied over the um, non-human world, um, but come the mid-19th century, as Lewis describes it in The Abolition of Man and also in De Descriptione Temporum, that uh, application is applied resolutely uh, to mankind itself over human nature. And he says that man's conquest over human nature um, uh, is 
needs further scrutiny. And in, in this, he says that man's power over nature turned out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. Now, why does he say this? Well, think of it in terms of contraception or the birth control pill, any pill like that. What we are doing is asserting an absolute power over future generations. We're not just controlling uh, what happens in our life, we're con controlling the ultimate future of other generations. And the the issue here is that it, it that it is it, it's it's a, a claim of uh, authority to do this by assertion of the will. Uh, and in this, I will say that there's some commonalities between uh, the view of the Cartesian self in its claim to be able to utilize and do with its own body what it wills and the sexual liberation movement. And, and it is exercised in a variety of ways, which I want to pull back on for a second and draw you back to what I said at the outset of our uh, exploration of literary theory back in the first semester when I talked about literary theories in relation to causality. So I talked about it in terms of so Aristotle's four causes. There was the initial cause, and if you want to see it, the the the, the cause of, of the creator, or in um, thinking in terms of Lewis's presentation, the the law of human nature. So the law of human nature, which was which was created by the one who created human nature, namely the creator. So we would look at the initial cause of that. And we could talk about in terms of literature, where we could talk about the intentions of the author uh, in creating this work. That would be a consideration for literature. But we could also see it in terms of the, the uh, material cause and the instrumental cause. So the instrumental cause being in terms of the text. <laughs> and in, in the new criticism and in modern uh, uh, or contemporary literary theory, they tend to we tend to only look at texts in terms of the instrumental cause, and in terms of the material cause. So the so the figures and tropes and schemes that lie within uh, the textual uh, structure. There, we're going to only look at the words on the page, and we're not going to consider the author's intention, namely the uh, what they call the. Um, uh, it's not the initial fallacy. It's the um, intentional fallacy and we're also not going to consider its ultimate uh, goal in doing this um, or its effect on the audience they will call this the the effective fallacy the new critics but the new critics effective now i'm being critical of the new critics here by the way the new critics have effectively done what every other modern liberal scholar does which is to reduce causality to merely instrumentality or efficiency it's 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 only instrumentality. We're only considered with the middle two causes, but we're not considered considering what the what the purpose or intention of the author was in all this. That is, of and in this case of human life, what the purpose of the human body is, or we're also not considered in eschatology. What's the ultimate goal of life? Is it in a Christian conception? It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's that's the ethics of this world, but it's also the ethics of um, the uh, kingdom of heaven in the world to come. There, There is an, uh, an eschatological uh, intent, uh, uh, direction there, a telos. <laughs> but in uh, technology, in the technological understanding of human nature, which develops post-19th century, uh, nature is being pushed to uh, uh, recapitulate the general attitude towards the human body that Descartes presents. So technology is, is regarded mechanistically and, and very reductively. So it, we're only looking at efficient causes. Um, it's also utilitarian. And we are willing to treat people as means to an end. And that will be Spayman's central thesis that we know we no longer look at people as having an inherent dignity which is beyond our capacity to influence and which we dare not override but rather 
people and we start with our own bodies to connect it with Haraway's essay and regard our body as something that is just like a uh, just like a machine something that we can manipulate and use for whatever purpose we designate in advance is a good one and finally where it's entirely voluntaristic insofar as we take the the exercise of our will as the ultimate measure of value we don't appeal to virtue ethics we don't appeal to even divine uh, command we don't appeal to the idea of, um, of a human nature uh, which C.S. Lewis argues in uh, the abolition of man in the Tao, that there is such a thing as a law of human nature, not according to uh, the cyborg humanism. So we have a view of human nature, which is, uh, and of the body, <coughs> as mechanistic, as utilitarian, and as voluntary. And what Haraway does in this little essay is to present this as wholly without problems because it is a way of advancing what she regards as um, uh, women's rights and women the women's movement and so she sees it as an advance on uh, on Western um, and uh, and sexual and uh, and Marxist discourse because she sees herself in the light of all of those things um, and she argues that a, a cyborg is is effectively a fusion of an animal and machine, and it, it effectively destroys the uh, previous oppositions which limited our capacity to engineer ourselves and, and control ourselves and will ourselves to be. Um, it destroys the, the, the boundary between nature and culture and the self and the world for that matter. And she says that this is Im important. For, for the feminist movements because uh, feminism uh, have historically been told that they are, or they are naturally weak and that they ought to be submissive, that they're over-emotional, that they're incapable of abstract thought. Well, this is her presentation of it. Where does she get this idea from? Well, there is some uh, substance for it, I think, in uh, the early church fathers and certainly in uh, Greek uh, philosophy. There's uh, some substance to this in the writings of Aristotle and Plato. We can see it in the early patristic period. There are some degrees of the uh, uncritical adoption of the pagan view of the male-female, but I think it rises to its fullest expression in, in Burke's understanding of the distinction between the sublime and the beautiful, which, would, if you recall, was re wholly related to the uh, the uh, relation to power. So something that was sublime was something that was more powerful than we. Whereas something that was beautiful is something that we, f we felt we had power over. And that was the key distinction. And then when you went to the description of what constitutes sublimity and what constitutes uh, beauty, we find that uh, women's bodies are seen as beautiful, whereas the ma the male being more angular uh, and more uh, 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 commanding was seen as more sublime. And you can see this being portrayed in, in the fiction of the day. And it becomes to, in the Victorian era to the point where they really are being portrayed in the form of the pop psychology depiction, you know, men being from Mars and women from Venus. Uh, Lewis himself in his uh, uh, science fiction to some degree attaches to these ideas uh, for the purposes of fiction, not for the purposes of anthropology. But for, for uh, Donna Haraway, this is a way of overcoming the inherent weakness which she simply accepts as being true of, of women. Uh, so it's an empowering movement. So the manifesto for cyborgs is a way of, of constructing an ironic political myth, myth that's faithful to the causes that she, uh, uh, she believes in, uh, namely uh, feminism, socialism, and materialism. It's a very strong embrace of that. <clears throat> now in that, it, it, he, she is doing what I think um, Heidegger says 
is a, a good thing, I guess, at least insofar as it actually identifies technology as being something that is not neutral. It is something that is decidedly um, uh, influential and, and transformative furthermore. As I say, I'm, I'm lecturing now to you because of the virus, no longer in person, but by means of a technological device, which has the power to not only capture what I am saying, but to put it on uh, YouTube and to be accessed from anywhere around the world at any time, presuming there's the electrical power to run it. Now, this is a hardly a neutral thing. It's an extraordinary, powerful, extraordinarily powerful thing. It does convey my words. On the other hand, in what way does it treat my human nature other than in terms of this image mediated by technology? But the, uh, in modern liberalism, characteristically, the idea of value neutrality conceals the fact that the, the whole logic of liberalism, of progressive emancipation from the body, is technological. And so that's the point I want. So it's inherently technological. It inherently, all the way back even to Baconian science, it inherently uses um, science in order to, uh, and when I say science, I'm talking about the techno technological artifacts developed by scientific observations in order to bring about what it calls freedom. So it's not just incidental, it's a strong sense. So there's a, a wonderful essay uh, by uh, Michael Hanby in uh, First Things. It was written in uh, October 2016. I'll try and pass it on to you, in which he explains this, and I think he's quite right in saying this, and I quote, if knowledge of nature is really engineering, then the truth of this knowledge is essentially whatever is technically possible. But since the ultimate limits of possibility can only be discovered by perpetually transgressing the present limits of possibility, a technological view of nature and truth commences an interminable revolution against every antecedent order or limit. A thoroughgoing technological society will therefore establish revolution as a permanent principle, paradoxically giving it the stability of an institutional form. Now, the institutional form that it has now is in the form of the modern research university. And, uh, and in terms of the, uh, uh, um, the bringing of, of progress into being the very mark of academic accomplishment, rather than rectitude to the principles of beauty, truth, and goodness, which are are wedded or hardwired into the order of the cosmos, uh, the modern research university regards these things as um, knowledge of the past, but in no ways advancement on our human nature. Our human nature is advanced through the permanent principle of revolution against the uh, antecedent order, whatever it was. And so yesterday's progress is, uh, is today's uh, ash heap of history. So if knowledge is, is power then, then truth is the possibility and politics is revolution. So says, um, where, what am I getting this from? Uh, Sean Haylock. And this is another uh, write, writing from uh, August 8th, 2017. Uh, the essay, which I'm going to get you to read, by the way, because I think it's terrific. Uh, is sexual liberation and the emergence of transhumanism. Um, and Haraway in this manifesto for cyborgs is exactly doing what uh, they are speaking of uh, here. So it is, a, it is a, seen as an extension of socialism, progressivism, and the women's rights movement. And the way in which she presents it is, is a, a wholly positive thing because it's an extension of the women's movement as she sees it going back all the way from its early beginnings from Mary uh, Wollstonecraft uh, uh, vindication of the rights of women all the way on to its its 
present day advocates, but note that is fundamentally embracing technology as part of its agenda and even the revolutionary implications in that. Now, once it does that, we have a very different type of literary theory appearing in front of us because what it, it it's it's inherently revolutionary quality is going to do and, and is going to insist upon and i'm just teasing out some of the implications here is that uh, the old great books of literature are effectively um, obsolete and what is the subject matter of literature is no longer literature per se um, it will be cultural studies. Cultural studies will form the intersection of, of where uh, our human nature currently lies and the boundary that we will, boundaries which we will push through technology, like even this means of speaking to you are, are using that. So to some degree, this is a cyborg uh, form of <coughs> technology in the way that in the last lecture I said that uh, Michel Foucault and the gender theorists had queered human identity by, by demanding that we uh, think in accordance with no longer the terms of father and mother and male and female, but rather of, a, of, a, of an aesthetic uh, moving beyond such binary characteristics or heterosexual and homosexual. In the same way, technology also pushes us to break down those boundaries. And so if, if their movement is accepted, then ipso facto the humanities as they were historically understood and enacted are of necessity obsolete. And that is not a particular problem for them. Um, so I've said a lot here by way of uh, introduction, but to some degree it's not even an introduction. It is getting to the heart of what Haraway is actually discussing here. Uh, because she sees and argues that in uh, uh, that in her uh, cyborg feminism, um, she is moving beyond uh, the essentialism of the early feminists. So they're no, she's no longer wishing for for women's rights equal to that of men. She's no longer arguing for an essential hu uh, feminist identity, which needs to be acknowledged in. Uh, the the academy and with looking at women heroines for example as role models for for women to to follow to emulate etc as in Jane Austen's works because Jane Austen is in general not very well regarded by feminist literary theorists at least in the uh, more radical contemporary forms she wants to be, move beyond those ideas that there is such a thing as a female essence and that there's a female uh, individual which deserves equal recognition to that of the male. She wants to move beyond that uh, in the to confuse the boundaries that existed altogether, not just between male and female, but again between uh, the human and the animal and the organism and the machine and the physical and the non-physical world. And this is pushing the boundary, pushing the envelope, if you will, of technological absolutism. And in that sense it is a form of transhumanism the, just the latest manifestation <coughs> and so it won't be lost on anyone listening to this of how much of contemporary science fiction is uh, preoccupied with exactly these sorts of things so whether you want to uh, point to Battlestar Galactica or a person of interest or Westworld or art house movies like AI or, or Wally, -E, or uh, Iron Giant, or uh, movies as far back as the 1980s of Robocop and the, a the Matrix and Terminator, Transformers, Star Wars, Star Trek, all of these, uh, all of these uh, sci-fi series are really dealing with the uh, total totalizing influence of technology in not just in uh, being a part of the human world, but determining it to the point where in, in Star Trek The Next Generation, the Borg is being presented as a <coughs> an artificial means that it's going to assimilate all of life and bring it up into the Borg. And while I'm, while I'm writing, 
and lecturing is happening through the means of Zoom or Loom or, uh, in this case, a, a YouTube lecture. And 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 many professions, robots are replacing human beings and the activities that human beings would have been done um, through robotics. And uh, the wide secular culture, which is our context right now, is obsessed with AI. Ten years ago, it was regarded as the provenance of, of a few rather eccentric individuals. Now it's become basically <coughs> ubiquitous around us. And there have been a slew of books that have appeared in recent years on the subject, on, on thinking machines, <coughs> on... Um, on perfecting human beings through human nature, through the means of machines, uh, through biochemical means, and largely through the understanding of human nature as the one, uh, or rather the thing, even the thinking substance in relation to the idea of that as the brain. So modern psychology, psychologists, tend to regard even the sub subject of psychology as a matter of observing the uh, consequences of brains. And so as a biochemical thing, as if what Descartes called thinking substance were literally the race extensa. And so it collapses any notion of human identity into the very material world and then seeks to influence it through chemical means. Uh, whether it's through uh, a, a pill <coughs> or whether it's through uh, augmentation, through steroids. Um, all of this is part of a cyborg technology. It's just not announced as such, but effectively that is what's going on. So Haraway in this essay presents it um, uh, in a, some ways better than Heidegger suggested uh, liberal modernity tends to do, she at least acknowledges that it is there. And in that sense, I think it's rather helpful. What is questionable, however, is whether this transhumanism, this cyborg feminism is actually a good thing. Is it a good thing for people who are, to my mind, fundamentally blighted by the problem of sin and the problems of power, which Lewis identified in the abolition of man, because what it effectively means, that man's power over nature and therefore the is going to be therefore not the power of all human beings over nature, but rather of those who control the technology. Therefore, and we have a limited capacity to that, uh, the women who use it, for example, in birth control, insofar as they can prevent the contraception of further humans. So this is a pretty terrific power. On the other hand, if we extend that over time and space, it will extend the power of humanity to the point where the human race itself will be extinguished. And so there's, there's a very large question there of whether we can embrace this as a good thing, let alone an extension of feminism, let alone an extension of socialism, since it will ultimately end in the loss of all human life for the sake of the advance of humanity. So it's a rather self-defeating enterprise. <coughs> uh, Haraway, her, for her own part, does not present it that way. Um, and she sees it as a, as a playful thing and as something that allows us to imagine our human nature in new and inviting ways. Uh, and <coughs> Uh, so it, it can be something that we reconstruct, and it means that everything's up for grabs. So she sees it as a positive, uh, uh, has a very positive view of these things. Everything's up for grabs, um, and, it's, and it's up for grabs for whoever is going to embrace it the most wholeheartedly. Now she writes from California, this is exactly what Silicon Valley has been doing for generations. <laughs> it's... Uh, and the question is, is this actually a removal of the problem of violence and the problems of domination, or is it making an endemic part of what is now called progress? That's my question. Um, they're trying to solve the, the, the problem that was observed in, uh, in my lecture on post-colonial literature, 
the problem of uh, white <coughs> Europeans dominating the rest of the world. The question is, does gaining power over human nature through technology solve the problem of domination or does it simply make it so endemic that there is, that we lose all of our freedom? And as I say, I'm writing here under effective house arrest and you're listening to it under effective house arrest in order to seek to try and contain or control the uh, ability of the healthcare system to respond to the crisis of this virus, which has broken through the boundaries of the control of the, <clears throat> the managing technological elite to be able to prevent disasters and it threatens to overcome it. In what sense would it overcome it? Well, people would get sick <clears throat> and die and there wouldn't be enough hospital beds to prevent that from happening. Uh, what would the loss be? Well, it would primarily be the illusion that we are in total control of human life. And so it would break the cult of uh, the idea that our elites managing society, socialism, uh, are able to determine human life from its conception to its conclusion. And as I write this also, uh, not only do we have abortion on demand, and abortion of course continues as I, as I speak, <clears throat> considered as an essential service by the government, in spite of the fact that if you have cancer, you can't be treated uh, in hospitals now because it's a non-essential service, I guess. Um, and also that the government's advancing euthanasia <clears throat> on demand. In all of these things, what we see is that there is an ultimate good and it's the, will, the, 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 the good of the will. So as I say, voluntarism there. <clears throat> and the only limit to that is the notion of consent which I have written about in relation to the Ontario sex ed curriculum as its fundamental premise, the only basis of dignity within this whole notion of technology is the idea of consent. The sole ethical uh, principle that's acknowledged in all of this technological humanism or cyborg feminism is the notion of consent. And I think it's a very narrow plank upon which to uh, lodge all human dignity uh, and it comes at the expense of not only human nature but human freedom and also the whole notion of beauty truth and goodness as having a transcendental sense and not a purely material sense so all of these things that seem to me to be sacrificed in the in the face of what uh, donna haraway regards as a, a capacity for an in infinite capacity uh, Cap uh, capability. And so cyber feminists like she uh, revel in what Freud called polymorphous perversity, because after all, everything is permitted under this so long as you consent to it. And so the boundaries between um, pleasure and abuse also collapse here. Uh, and we also see the growth now then of, of the movement of what uh, has been likened to be mon uh, mummy porn, namely the this wildly popular series fifty or forty shades or fifty shades of grey, <clears throat> and uh, the abuse of a of a woman by a powerful man, which one would have thought was the very contradiction of feminism, and yet, as I say, within the construct of human nature, is something that we nearly merely need to consent to there is no actual ethical or moral objection to this fact. So I find this highly problematic for somebody who would want to regard himself as a feminist in the sense that I would regard women uh, as having an inherent dignity that deserves proper treatment and there would be limits on that and consent would not be the limit to it. It's, it's not a matter of consent. After all, people who are in a, in a position of powerlessness really lack the capacity to fully consent to something because they're being coerced by circumstances. So in a way, um, women uh, like Haraway uh, are at the center of uh, contemporary politics and the networks that arrive out of this and the extension of this. So as Haraway puts it, <coughs> human beings are always already immersed in the world. 
in producing what it means to be human in relationships with each other and with objects. So there's a there's a, a the idea of a humanity as a network, <clears throat> or if you will, as a Borg, uh, and an in interconnection. And so she she says, if you start talking to people about how they cook their dinner or what kind of language they use to describe trouble in a marriage, you're very likely to get notions of 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 loops or communication breakdowns or a, a, there's a lot of noise and there's signal disruptions in marriage. So we're using technological language even to describe that. And I said that in relation to um, Oliver O'Donovan's uh, work, Begotten Not Made. He notices even when we're talking about begetting, <clears throat> having babies, we don't use the word begetting. And in general, not many people even speak of procreation anymore because it has the word creation in there, which uh, we want to get away from when I say we are progressive technological society. Instead, we speak of reproduction. And reproduction is the mechanical copying <clears throat> of one thing in the form of another. Now, this is this is not a new thing. As I say, it's 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 a growing phenomenon which begins in science fiction and gradually becomes characteristic of the society that revels in the very thing that science fiction talks about, namely the domination of human nature by the human will through the instrumentality of the scientist <clears throat> and his notion of progress. The question is, how do we define the progress? And in what sense does progress occur when the loss of the very dignity of human nature is the result? And with that, I leave you and we'll talk to you next time about transhumanism in its further extensions.